at Focus on Liberia, we discuss everything Liberia, from education to politics, arts and culture, entertainment, agriculture, history, religion, family, and technology. Focus on Liberia uncovers and showcases the best of Liberia and shows the world the truth about Liberia. We educate, elevate, and promote all things Liberia. We conduct interviews, panel discussions, debates, and more. Tune in to Focus on Liberia on Facebook and YouTube and be a part of the stories that make up the news. This is Focus on Liberia, and I am Dennis Jack. And I am Priscilla Gianato. Welcome to Focus on Liberia. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a new day today. And as we always say here, we are working towards a whole new world of social reform. So on this program, we discuss gender equality or gender justice in our societies. Our conversations um, cover sexual gender-based violence, identifying root causes and seeking ways to address that and related issues by harnessing healthy and generally acceptable traditional values, systems and practices, healthy religious values and practices, as well as practical global values and systems for women and girls equal rights. Our hope is that these kind of conversations will contribute to change in mindset and attitude about women and girls human rights and lead to a shift in our culture of impunity. Uh, today on a new day, we have with us, I'm sorry, my device want to act off. So today on a new day, we have with us Dr. Tanya Asanta Gartner. Dr. Gartner has two decades of experience in international development as a professor, technical advisor, research, and gender expert. As an educator, both in the United States and in Liberia, she teaches international development and gender studies, facilitating knowledge, sharing with youth and mid-career professionals. She's passionate about strengthening the effectiveness of international development through meaningful collaboration, critical thinking, organizational change management, pertinent um, evidence-based analysis, participatory program design, and systematic monitoring, evaluation, and learning. Uh, Dr. Gardner obtained her doctorate degree in international development from Tulane University Law School. Her research interests have focused on gender and development peace processes, and post-conflict societies. Dr. Gardner is the director of the University of Liberia's Ibrahim B. Bambagida School for International Studies and assistant professor at the Honors College of Gender Studies and Interdisciplinary Research. She recently launched a feminist research firm, NOLA uh, Research and Consulting, exploring the nexus between gender and development, stakeholder and community engagement, and sustainable natural resource management. She is based in Monrovia, Liberia with her family. Thank you for joining us today, this morning. Dr. Gartner, it's a pleasure, it's an honor to have you. Thank you, Priscilla. It's my honor to be here with you and with you all. Okay, uh, so um, I'm going to jump right into it because we, because of the time difference, we um, lost one hour already uh, um, on this program. So I'm just going to go into it. Um, we want you to please enlighten us, because you wrote before that, to understand the complex relations between power, authority, in the female gender, in the Liberian context, it is important to investigate gender relations in a historical light. So I get this all the time, almost times. Uh, you African women 
this your gender equality thing what you you doing what you talking about this is not our culture but you taught or maybe you continue to teach that about african feminism and you indicated that there has always been women resistance please help us enlighten us a little bit yes i think you know i get this often too because i teach um gender sensitivity to um, mid-career professionals, meaning adults who are already working in their various fields, not younger students, um, and people who are working in government, non-governmental organizations, NGOs, civil society. Um, there's a great need to do gender sensitivity work there, even for those who are working in the area of gender. And I get that all the time. People think that gender is, or gender equality is a Western import. Um, and something that that uh, was brought to Liberia and brought to Africa. But when we actually look back at our history, we recognize that there are many um, powerful women throughout African history. Um, notable examples of queens. Um, in fact, I was just reading something about um, Queen Nefertiti, about uh, Amina of Hausa land. Um, in our own regional context, we know about Swakoko, uh, Swako, uh, So there are many examples of women in going back um, centuries and centuries of African women who were rulers, who were in positions of leadership, who were decision makers, who were warriors, who were queens. And so it's been a long time that this concept of, of women um, pushing barriers and, and being in leadership positions it's been a long time since that's been the reality. I think um, this current wave of gender equality that has kind of come back around perhaps, especially in the uh, peace process and the post-conflict process has made people think that it's new, but it's definitely not new. And actually West Africa is known typically as the region where African women have the most power. West Africa you know, is known for that historically. And so it's no surprise that Liberia would be the place where we would have the first female elected president. Um, and even before her, Ruth Sando Perry serving as the first female head of state in Africa. So, you know, this is very much part of, of the history. And when we look back, we recognize that it's not foreign. It's, it's very much a part of, of our own society as well. Yeah, yeah. So, um... So when people resisting women and girls' equal rights uh, with the contention that the advocacy for these rights uh, is on African or not African culture, uh, we can safely attribute that perspective to their limited exposure to the aspect of our full and rich history of Asian African values and, practice, uh, uh, and practices. Uh, and I took some time because of that, going through um, the, the history of these women, some of them who you name in our um, New Day community. And I'll continue to do that um, because, you know, it was interesting. I was listening to uh, you and Dr. Patrick Burroughs, uh, and then he gave this uh, good example uh, where he shared the story of Zaire on uh, Mabutu Sisiseku, where he said Mabutu changed the country name from Congo to Zaire based on the misunderstanding that Zaire was a local name and it was Portuguese. So you change the, the, the name of an entire country uh, only to find out that the name you're replacing it with is not yours, it's from outside. Uh, uh, and one one can just see that the, the, the moral lesson in that is that um, as beautiful as gender equality is uh, and beneficial to societies uh, uh, and tell the world about how great we were at a certain point in history, we continue to give that credit uh, or we continue to, to deny that a part of our own identity as African. I don't know, I may be just be going on and on, but that's that's why when while you were having that conversation, you said we need to look at history from a, a gender lens. I want you to, to please talk a little bit about that. You know, in in uh, the academic literature, we always say knowledge is power, right? And and the person who 
has the power is the one who gets to say what the knowledge is, what is correct, what is wrong, what is right, what's fact, what's truth, what's actually happened. And because of patriarchy, patriarchy meaning um, a social system wherein men are the holders of power and women are usually held to the exclusion of that power or excluded from that power fully. Because of patriarchy, uh, you know, the story of history has been told by men, right? Um, the same way in many senses, the way that uh, the history of the world has been told by the West. Um, so it, often I equate those two things, especially when I'm, when I'm doing gender trainings for, for African men, I can remind them, you know, privilege is privilege, power is power. So the same power that uh, Liberian women and men are fighting for, you know, people from the global South, quote unquote, are also fighting for that power, for that recognition, for their voice to be heard in this global debate. Um, so the same way that Africans are not new to history uh, and to global dynamics, women are not new to history and to the dynamics that have been happening within our country. It's just that we are not really in positions of authority to be the ones to tell that story. Yes. So to go back and have a gender lens in history is to see that uh, women have been active, they've been participating, they've been involved in the making of our societies and the changing of our societies, but we don't often see things from their lens. We don't often see things from their perspective because they often are not in the public sphere, right? They're not the ones in public um, office and governance. They tend to be in the private sphere, the home sphere, the market sphere, which is kind of relegated to women, right? So because of that, women tend not to be um, very noticeable in history. And so to have that historical lens is to kind of go back and reinterpret and say there's a whole half of the story missing. What are we missing? What there's so much more interesting elements, dynamics. Um, you know, one of my favorite courses in in um, college in sociology was household to world systems. So what happens at the household folds up into the national level, and then the global level. And what happens in the global environment also folds down to the national community and household level. These things are interrelated. And so yeah. when you miss yeah. out on the woman's story, the woman's perspective, you miss out on so much of what's actually making those dynamics shift and change in the larger society. And so I think there's a lot of exciting research that still needs to be done, looking back and, and understanding things from a woman's perspective or having what we tend to call a gender or feminist lens. It's just to add women's voices to the narrative that we've often heard. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Um, so, it's, 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 it's great that you compare it or usually you bring in the part about um, how the, the Western world uh, has a quote unquote much more shiny or powerful microphone. So they take the world stage. Um, hopefully that resonates with African men um, to see that because most times when they resist, or they don't tell our stories right, and and I and I do the same thing, and I have to say, yeah, isn't it the same thing women have been saying, <laughs> right? So, um, so then we accuse, or sometimes we conclude with like they deliberately leave out on um, part of it's possible. Uh, I mean, that's that could be an explanation that people who do that sometimes who have the power to tell story they as they abuse their power when they do not um when they do not show that much respect to the story of those who stories they are telling right uh, so i think it deliberately because when men write history and leave i, I may deliberate to some extent when men write history and leave our records of women who did not conform, for instance, women who resisted from within or question the status quo. And, and the result of it is to make us believe this false assumption that uh, uh, the women were okay in the past because we get that. They tell us that and who now are saying no, who they see as troublemakers. Uh, they tell us uh, your great grandmothers or our great grandmothers, things used to be okay. They knew their place, you know, they conformed. Things were okay. We had it all. They gave me, I mean, men just did what they choose to do. So this, this is, this is a, uh, uh, this has the consequence of 
I don't know. Like it does empower us to some extent because then we think that this had never been done before. And we are the ones who are trying to, to make trouble, even though the world has been all calm and very great for everyone before we came along. You know, I think some of it is definitely deliberate, but some of it, um, though negative, is just so um, subconscious. It's unconscious. You know, we've kind of taken to be normal that men should have power and women should not. So even well-meaning men, even well-meaning historians, they just take for granted that women's voices should be heard. It's become so normalized in our society that men dominate and men are in the public sphere um, and that women are just mothers and wives that should be home, um, you know, and not actively participating in the discussion or in the debate. And so they've really internalized that patriarchy. And the interesting part is that even women internalize that patriarchy, right? There are many women who will even tell their daughters, why are you concerning yourself with these things? These are not for women to do, you know, or when women try to make a change, you know, when I say society changes from the inside out, as well as from the outside in intergenerationally, that's one of the ways we see society changing a lot from inside, right? So from one generation to a next, different context, different exposure, different access to, uh, to resources, to technology, you know, younger generations are coming up and challenging the status quo as well. And sometimes it's their mothers who have so internalized that patriarchy that they will tell the, the younger ones, well, who are you to challenge the system? I went through it. Why do you think it should be any different for you, right? So even women, um, we are so indoctrinated and socialized in a system of patriarchy that we replicate and repro reproduce that society as well. So if women can do it, you know that men can do it as well, right? That they too... Um, not, you know, not necessarily deliberately, though perhaps sometimes, but sometimes it's also just it, we take for granted that society has just always been that way. And I think also we um, as Liberians and as Africans as a whole have not been so much into the documentation of our history, right? Um, and so it really makes it challenging for historians to be able to go back and also see the contribution of women. And that's why I really enjoy um, Dr. Burroughs' work because his history of Liberia is, is using multiple formats because of that lack of um, documented written history. He uses archeology span um, and other, you know, other forms yeah, to really piece together our narrative in a way that that's really um, can be um, validated. It's really validated and, and triangulated coming from different angles. Um, so I think, you know, definitely there is some effort to, to keep women relegated to that private sphere. And we're seeing that now too, as women are trying to um, run for political, political office and the, the violence and the, um, you know, discrimination that they face, we can definitely see that there's some effort to keep women out of the public space. Um, I think it's because some men find it threatening, right? That um, there's already enough to contend with other uh, opposition. When you add women into the mix too, it's just more kind of competition over resources, over space, over power. Um, but I think we're so much of us, you know, we're socialized with, with, um, with just this assumption that women should not be in power. And that's what we have to change, right? And that's why it's representation is important. Um, while, you know, Ellen Johnson Sully being the first elected female president in Africa was, you know, it was a big deal in terms of representation. We know that that didn't necessarily change all of Liberia. Liberia did not stop becoming a patriarchy. We didn't become a matriarchy overnight. But that representation is important. It's very important because it shows that women can um, be in political office. Women can make a difference. Women can contribute. Um, and that just by that representation creates more of that space and changes that narrative bit by bit. Small, small, as we say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree. Uh, I, I'm thinking that sometimes the women who kind of protect, I mean, enforce the patriarchy, uh, most times, I, my, from my experience, is your loved one or someone really close to you. And they think they're doing it to protect you because, hey, you know, I went through this. Don't get yourself hurt. Because I remember my mother always told me that from the time I was a little girl. And, you know, in our language, we say, you a cash out in the world, Ziti. And, you know, you be careful you're not married or you're not because she just saw that she she kept showing me some of the attributes you have or the tendency you, you know, 
they are not woman-like to her understanding. So uh, uh, stay in certain conflict. This is what is expected of you as a woman. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. and I always resisted those kind of things, uh, you know, <laughs> from childhood. So yeah, I agree. Uh, and that's uh, what I we think call gender norms, right? Yeah, let me bring the academic in there a little bit, right? That Those are what we call gender norms. Gender norms are the roles and expectations that women and men are, are supposed to follow. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, I lecture at the University of Liberia in the Gender Studies Program, and this is something that we talk about all the time. Um, because, you know, we also we tend to think that patriarchy is only negative for women, but it's also negative for men, right? Because there are certain norms and expectations that men have to uphold too that can be difficult to uphold, right? For example, men are not supposed to be emotional, right? Men are not supposed to cry. So I can ask my students, so men don't have the same tear ducts? Right. When when they you know, what, why did God give men tear ducts if tears were not supposed to flow from them? Right. So men are also very much constrained and confined by gender roles, not only women. And I think it's important for us to think about that because that's what helps men to also be comfortable challenging those gender norms for themselves as well. Uh, in one of the trainings I did in the southeast, I remember a man telling me that he loves to cook and he likes to go to the market and to pick his own uh, um, produce and to cook and he's just and he's a better cook than his wife so they suffer less when he cooks right but yeah, that in the society is just so frowned upon and people would just the peer pressure to conform to those gender norms right that he would go to the market and the women would always charge him more right because they just assume as a man he doesn't know what the price of goods are <laughs> so that's the first level of discrimination he will face and then they will be laughing at him oh what are we cooking today what in the pot today you know they, even the women would discourage him from cooking. Maybe because their husbands never cooked and they'd never seen that, you know. Um, and so they would always kind of give him that pressure to get out the kitchen. And his friends, of course, too, they would laugh at him and say, oh, my man, you're cooking today. You know, they would kind of mock him. And when I was doing the training, he just felt so relieved that somebody understood that men also are under pressure to conform. And I think he left there a bit empowered, like, yeah, I will go back to the market, I will cook because I enjoy cooking. And Men can cook too, you know, he was empowered by that too. So I think we also need to create that space for men to understand that gender norms are also restricting them and that it's a benefit for them as well to, to be able to, to live free of those expectations that society puts on us. Yeah, yeah, oh, that's a good one. Uh, yeah, and, and that's why you, you also talked about how culture evolves. So hopefully, 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 uh, as the kind of trainings you do, and we're hoping a new day, you know, uh, we'll be challenging uh, our view of things. And then, you know, we will evolve, hopefully. Um, and Priscilla, because... let me add, Go ahead. Because we, uh, just to add on that, a new day, I think is a very fitting title, you know, for, for this kind of discussion. Um, because you. really the, the um, kind of the post-war era is a new day, right? That, you know, and this is what a lot of the scholars talk about. I think it can be difficult to hear, especially for those of us who have been, you know, severely traumatized by our conflict in Liberia. But actually, conflict leads to transformation, right? It, it's a time where social norms mm -hmm. are broken down and room is created, right, for, for new ways of doing, for a new day, right? And so... You know, though we suffer through our conflict, it presents an exciting opportunity for us to challenge those old systems, those old ways of doing things, and to evolve. It's, it actually speeds up the evolution. You actually find that in countries that have experienced war, you have more women in political office, right? Because there's this general breakdown of the previous ways of doing things, the old ways of doing things, and a new day can be born. So we're also in a position you know, now and still in this era now where we can really push for that transformation um, in a way that we wouldn't have been able to if we had not gone through our conflict. So it's, it's one perhaps small but important silver lining. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that encouragement. I appreciate that. One day at a time, like you said, small, small, uh, right? Small, small. <laughs> we'll continue to yeah do all our the little that we can in our little corners of the world. And small, 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 small. A uh, new day is possible. Um. So you mentioned South Africa. I want to go back to not South Africa, West Africa. I want to go back to history. Um. It's interesting. Um. Uh, when you shared about and I read, I read about that that 
but I, I read about that um, example before. And then I heard you mention it in another broadcast. I like, yeah, when you talked about um, how um, the patriarchy that was imported, uh, uh, the form of patriarchy that was imported, uh, uh, especially in West Africa, um, when you mentioned how the women in West Africa, you know, uh, the level it, it affected, it impacted their roles in society and all of that. I want you to please share that story about what happened when the British traders got on the coast of Nigeria and their reaction because of what they believe. Yeah, so this is an example that's often given when we explore the, the impact of colonialism on our um, gender roles. Um, because, you know, especially in West Africa and, and perhaps through many parts of Africa, women are traders in the markets. Um, and actually, that is one of the reasons why we say in West Africa, women have quite important roles in society, because as the trader, you deal with a lot of, of, um, of money, right? And so there was a lot of wealth that women generated and held, and also they created strong networks with other women, right? Because you have your trading partners in Guinea, you have your trading partners in Sierra Leone. In Togo. In Senegal, in Togo. And so in, throughout the region, there's a strong network of women trading. And so that has been the case historically. But what happened is there are several instances, especially in Nigeria, that are historically cited. When the European traders came, the women were sent forward because they just assumed that they came to trade. And so the women were the traders. And so the women naturally in our mindset at the time went forward to trade. And the men, especially think about Victorian England at the time, which had very staunch gender roles for women, right? Women were very much relegated to the private sphere. Women were not trading, especially women of middle and upper class. Of course, class always has a role to play in gender roles as well. Um, that's what we call an intersectional lens where you have to think about not only um, gender, but also class economic status and the role that that has as well. Um, but when the men were confronted, when those uh, British traders were confronted with the women, they sent the woman back and they said, no, we don't, we don't deal with women. We don't trade with women. Send the men. Um, and so that's an example of how, you know, trade and international influence and colonialism particularly created another level of inequality for women and, and kind of lowered the status of women because women could no longer trade freely with foreigners as they had done in the past because those gender norms um, that those traders came with had an impact on the society, right? And, and created shifts in the way that African women traded um, in their region prior to that. So that's an example of how colonialism definitely had its influence. Um, and you know, even in the Liberia case, we like to say that Liberia was never colonized and that's, that's a whole nother show uh, in and of itself. But of course we had our own form of colonization. And we have to remember that the um, ACS and the settlers that came to Liberia in the 1800s came with their own agenda norms, right? They've come from an American plantation um, or, or island plantation mentality um, and where there were also gender norms at play. Um, there's a lot of missionary colonization we talk about in Liberian history that missionaries are really key in colonizing Liberia. And so they brought with them that perspective um, and that kind of biblical understanding of what gender roles should be. And that also had an impact on the traditional gender roles that existed. And I think in Liberia's case, historically, it tended to send our, our indigenous culture underground, right? So now our societies became secret societies. You know, what, what is it that made them secret? You know, why were they, was it not just the culture? Was it just not the tradition? It became a secret society because it, it was moving against or going against a missionary norm, norm, right? About what women should do, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. Um, and so it became secret, you know, and kind of driven underground. Um, and so that's also part of our history that we often don't talk about, but that also had an influence on gender norms. Yeah, yeah, wow. It's really, it's really important to, to this just, this just goes to show that, uh, and we have a whole channel here on Focus on Liberia where we look at uh, our history. It's called the History Channel. And mm. the presenter, yeah, the presenter uh, always uh, encourage us there, you know, to study our history, uh, study our history. So, 
because there's always a perspective or agenda or possibly will be an agenda for the one who writing this aspect of history so it's it's um you know it's encouraged that you always investigate the source of what you you you're reading the aspect of history you're reading what is the what well, what is the agenda of the author and stuff like that if you want to get a full rich picture of uh our history mm -hmm. uh that brings me to something that dr uh, um, Burroughs mentioned about I think you you were talking to him about the Kola Forest or so the book uh, the, mm -hmm. one of his books I have here uh, and he's talking about uh, how the issue of female genital mutilation there is no evidence of that you know based on that history of our people and that the indication is that it was later brought on through Islamic influence. But today, we will argue just because we do not really look into our history further. We will argue that this is our African history. Uh, but there's no evidence that this this was part of this, you know, the Sandy society, the issue of um, female genital mutilation. So one, one, one key thing you add to that is that, yeah, even as we investigate our, we thought of about studying our history, we should apply the, gen, the, the, you know, the gender lens so that we can be able to get a full picture. And I just wanted to add that part there. Um, and before let me I go let me let me just follow up on that a bit um, because it goes back to this idea of, of society being static, you know, and not changing. And I think that it's important for us to, to decolonize our own thinking when we think about our own African societies, right? Because I think we have internalized colonization in a way. We assume that African society is simplistic. We assume that um, there has not been movement of peoples, right, in, in social religious, cultural change constantly happening, right? And what I like about Dr. Burroughs' work too is that he shows how the, the peoples of Liberia have been moving, that Liberia is a meeting point of multiple ethnic groups based on other social, cultural governance dynamics, right? One empire, the Mali Empire falls, that sends a certain group of, of people to settle in the Liberian, uh, what is now the Liberian region, right? So there was movement um, and, and shifting of culture. So it's very possible that, that FGM could have come into Liberia and become part of the culture, right? Now, as we hold on to that culture, and I think a lot of societies are facing this issue, holding on to our culture because we're in a very quickly evolving world and that can be scary for some people. They feel that their culture and society will get lost. So there are certain elements that we hold on to and forgetting that some of those elements may have come and gone, right? And so because society is shifting, we need to be open to it evolving, you know? So if there's a pressure, whether from within or without to eliminate certain harmful practices, that there's a way to do that without totally losing our culture. Um, and I always advocate for us thinking about ways to improve our culture without, without totally neglecting and forgetting it, right? There's so many positive practices that are in the Sandy School. How do we bring those practices out? How do we really even bring more light to them and add to them and, and really use them to strengthen our cultural identity whilst at the same time, those elements that are harmful, releasing them. So I think that as Liberians, we have a lot of discussion um, and debating that still needs to happen around these issues. And we have to be, I think, open and willing to shift and change for the betterment of our society. How are we going to make this new Liberia? How are we going to form it? What elements do we need to shift? And not only just in FGM, but in so many ways, in gender roles, of course, more broadly in the way that, you know, in gender studies, we always say that gender is the first inequality, but it's one of many inequalities, right? There's ethnic inequality, rural, urban inequality, um, you know, income inequality. There are many types of inequality that plague our society and gender is just kind of the fundamental one because no matter what social group you're in, no matter what ethnicity you're in, women and men are still unequal, right? So gender is the original inequality, but it's one of many inequalities. So we have to really be open to having these discussions and really trying to have this social justice mentality that you mentioned earlier where 
you know, how do we make ourselves better? How do we ensure that Liberia is a place that everybody can thrive in? And I think that's that's our work at hand. And history helps us to have that lens to, to see exactly. where we're really coming from. Yeah, see where we're coming from as we chart where we're going. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, history is. Because uh, how can you know what to hold on to and what to let go if you don't even know what was originally yours, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, mm -hmm. And then even if it was originally yours, it, what purpose is it serving for today? Um, mm -hmm. But important, yeah, but, but yeah, how do you, first of all, know what really was before? Look at it, look at it, the example you gave about um, the European traders coming in with all the pushback we get from our own brothers and family, like, this is your Western, this your gender equality thing is Western, um, uh, not even understanding that uh, the patriarchy was imported or the certain aspect of it, um, the fear of the power of women, the, like, you know, the power of misogyny that, that, that Europeans had, you know, how do you get to a place and then the women have so much economic power uh, and mm -hmm. this is still, and I read an article talking about the women in Togo, the kind of strong network they build because of this same strong economic power that they have. And their mm -hmm. husbands, most of them, their partners are politicians. And they, they tell of how they just have political power, but economically they rely on the women. Some of them have more than mm -hmm. one, one or something wives and they don't, they don't have to stress about keeping those households because really mm -hmm. they cannot keep those households. They are those women that keep it in themselves because of, mm -hmm. you know, the economic strength they have. So you get mm -hmm. to a place where women have so much huge role in the economy of this area. And then you come and change the dynamics because of your, you know, your misogyny, uh, mm -hmm. uh, misogynistic uh, um, culture. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand some of these things, where they come from. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, I want to start, uh, if you can quickly uh, uh, talk about bargaining with the patriarchy. Uh, you mentioned how even at the university level, uh, women are less watching each other, policing each other when they dress cool. Mm -hmm. That is so interesting. You know, this is something um, that we, we call in African feminism, um, the politics of respectability, right? Um, and that it's something that I think applies to women and men in some instances. I was talking to, it, uh, to a friend of mine recently, he was talking about what it means to be um, a family of importance um, in the Islamic community and that there also there are politics of respectability, right? Um, in terms of what is expected of you, how you're supposed to behave, how you're supposed to dress. But in African feminism, we often talk about it in reference to women's struggle. The struggle for, for um, respectability in Africa for women is, is a bit more complex because we are in a very hierarchical uh, respect for elders oriented society where um, you have to carry yourself a particular way, you have to dress a particular way. Meaning also that some of the feminist methods, approaches, strategies that might work in the West don't necessarily work in the African context, right? Um, in Africa, we're very much concerned with respectability. You have to, you know, in our society, what will your father think of you if your father or your uncle or your brothers, you know, your, your name, your reputation is very much tied to your whole family unit, which is not necessarily the case in other more Western contexts. And so African women often have to contend with these politics of respectability, how you dress, how you carry yourself, um, you know, because we have so much sexual exploitation in our schools and in our workplaces, how do you um, excel professionally without being perceived as, um, you know, getting your promotion a different way? Uh, you know, how do you dress? How do you um, ensure that you can be respected in a male-dominated sphere, right? This is something that, that often concerns women. And so women police each other in the sense that you know, how you are represented, how you represent yourself represents me as well. You know, I'm a student here at the university, as are you. 
if you are um, perceived as, as only advancing in the wrong way, then that has an implication on me. And that um, research was actually carried out by my co-author of that um, article that you're referring to, uh, Carrie Orgart. She did some research at the university kind of studying um, women who were trying to pursue um, degrees um, and, and the different strategies and approaches that they took. And these are one of the things that she discovered that women tend to police each other and say, no, you know, don't, don't come with that unserious. They will not take us seriously, us, right? We, we have to represent each other. You have to be careful how you dress, what kind of hair, and you know, you have to tone it down. We really have to try to conform um, to this male dominated environment because already by a fact of your gender, you have more attention. People may already not take you as seriously because especially at the tertiary level, at the university level, women are, are in a minority, a great minority in Liberia. And so um, there's pressure to really conform, to be taken seriously. And so the way that we dress, and this is why, you know, the, the body politics, right? That um, politics and, and the fight for equality happens in our bodies, on women's bodies. Men don't usually have to contend with that. Yet they argue that we, um, they don't see inequality. Like, how are you not having this kind of pressure, but I have to go through that uh, and just because of my gender? Um, and and then it can be so sometimes semi up the wall when some men contain that. I don't see you know what you're really talking about. Uh, um, oh, you know how mm -hmm. you don't experience life the same way I experience life, and you continue to no. argue. No, there are a couple of exercises that I do in the gender sensitivity training, um, and one of them is is the, is a concept of having a backpack. And it's a backpack of privilege. And so I take a backpack and I make the man carry it. And comparing his life to a woman's life, what are the different privileges that you have? You have a certain level of privilege in, in terms of the way that you can dress. You never, how often do you wake up in the morning and think you put something on and say, oh, no, no, this is too much. It's too revealing or it's too tight. Or, you know, I don't want people to perceive me a particular way. Men never have to think about that, how they dress. They just get up and they go, right? Um, or you're walking at night by yourself. Um, generally speaking, men don't really have to think about that. Oh, I'm just going down the street to get something. They never think, oh, I'm by myself. You know, I'm, will I be raped? Will I be harassed? You know, there, there are a lot of privileges that men take for granted. So a lot of times we have to help them see the privilege that they have in being male, and which means that the disadvantage that women have in being female in our societies, especially in misogynistic societies. And though we don't like to think of Liberia as a misogynistic society, misogyny literally means the hatred or dislike of women. And I, I tell my gender students all the time, we draw, I, I, I'm ready to be professor now and draw on this wall my gender tree. And right. the fruit of the tree are, you know, GBV, that's an example. You know, the fruit of GBV is an example of the fruit. And what's at the root is misogyny, is patriarchy, you know, because GBV, rape, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, those are very much the fruit of misogyny. You know, this hatred and dislike of women where women are not safe just by sheer fact of being a woman, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, and so we really do have a misogynistic society and we need to see it as such. Mm -hmm. right? And our high rates of GBV and the, the, the um, age of the victims of GBV in Liberia really point to some seriously deep-rooted misogynistic values that we have to uproot. Um, and I think talking about it, thinking about it, you know, researching it is one of the ways that we, we can do that. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm starting to um, do a research project fo focused on masculinity because oftentimes we see in the literature that that's what's missing. We do a lot of studies on feminism, on women, especially Liberian women, especially because of the role in the conflict or in the peace process. There's a lot of research that's been done on them. Actually, if you, as you know, if you do some research, there's a lot of, a lot written on, on Liberian women, but what about the Liberian men? What about masculinity? How is it that um, we have the kind of misogyny that we have in our society? Where, where did it come from? And a lot of that can only be understood when we really understand men and we understand what masculinity means in our context. And so that's an area of research that needs more light shed. Um, and I hope to be doing that soon. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, it would be great if you... Uh, I've reached out to a few um, people who have done research on that and uh, authors of both uh, uh, um, who are still working on 
being able to get it on here. One of the books is Misogyny, Boys Will Be Boys, and, and, a, and another author uh, and researcher. Uh, but uh, I, too, did started writing on that misogyny. For instance, I was talking to someone, talking about sharing a video uh, of a girl, uh, and I'm asking why why do you think that you should do that? Oh, he wants to shame uh, the guy. Uh, because I was like, this is a power thing. Uh, the, the, this guy told the girl, do this, then I'll be able to send you Christmas money. And she did. The, the, the. Yeah, so I want to shame him. Okay, is he in the video? No, then I so what's his name? No, I don't want to get him in trouble. And I'm like, okay, so how are you wanting to shame me? You don't want to get him in trouble. At the end of the day, who are you really shaming? You know, you mm -hmm. hesitate to even say the name in private to me. Can you mm -hmm. really think about how you had no second thought about, you know, exposing and shaming a girl? This is misogyny. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't tell you it like that, but uh, when mm -hmm. I was doing my article, those are some of the the the, the examples I was highlighting. Like, how yeah. do we now have second thought on shaming girls or women, and um, but then we'll have all the justification for a guy, you know, that your husband or your spouse is exploiting mm -hmm. a little girl, staying with you, but. You know, he's excused. You have all the good reasons for excusing him, but then this little girl or her family are demonized. You are trying to help mm -hmm. them, you know, mm -hmm. to her to school. She went, ties your mm -hmm. husband, and all those kind of things. And so, yeah, and, and the sexual objectification that's, you know, the sexual objectification of women is part of misogyny, right? To see women primarily as sexual objects. We take for granted too that that's an element of misogyny. Right, men are not taken at face value as sexual objects, but women very much are, and that and, and that's what makes it difficult for professional women too. You know that you're not you want to be seen as a leader, you want to be seen as a politician or as a decision maker or as a business owner. There are various aspects of you, not just your sexual beingness, right? But we tend to see women primarily as sexual objects, and that's a prime example of, of misogyny. Exactly. Exactly. I don't know. I, I shared the poster, the flyer of this program, you know, and I had your bio. The only thing I didn't have was you live with your family in Moravia and you would think that someone would be impressed and say, oh, great. I will listen to this program or, you know, this is an expert. But his question is, is she married? And I'm asking, why are you asking that question? <laughs> like, it's a yeah, that's a good point because, you know, when I first started um, working in Liberia, I would see people put on their CV, married, 38, you know, they put the details, their marital status on their CVs. And I used to think, why on earth would you put your marital status on your CV? It's one, it's nobody's business. And two, we're not hiring me for that. But I realized <laughs> that it's part of the culture where some women also put their marital status to appear less threatening in the workplace meaning I'm married and so I would not cause problems there because there's this traditional misogynistic, patriarchal, call it what you will, perspective that single women are a threat, right? Because they will not be focused with their work. They will be looking for husband or looking for someone's husband or, you know, so women tend to wear their marital status as a badge of honor. And that goes back to the bargaining with patriarchy, right? I know that in this patriarchal society, I'm less threatening as a mother. I'm less threatening as a wife. So I will push those elements forward, you know, and use it as my advantage, you know, and that's often in the, in the wartime, that's the bargaining with patriarchy. Women said, oh, I'm your mother. I'm your sister. You know, we need to stop this violence. And it worked. It was effective. But the issue is it doesn't challenge the status quo because if I'm a young woman, if I'm not married, then... I don't get that privilege. I don't get that recognition. I don't get that chance, right? And so we recognize that it continues to constrain women in a box. You know, as a woman, you should be married. You should have children. And it's only then that you will be considered respectable. Women, men don't have to contend with that, right? Men don't have to be married to be considered responsible, you know? Um, and so we need to think about what that means for women's roles in the long run. And though it may be effective in some ways, it doesn't really push or challenge um, the patriarchal system to continue to bargain with patriarchy in that way. 
And that's exactly what he said. He came back and he's like, oh, no, I'm only asking because uh, uh, you have the entire uh, her her bio, but you did you you didn't say whether she 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 has and you have a son and you're proud of your son. So women can be proud. And I'm like, wow, I just can't deal with this this morning. I was just this way. You know, I was like, I can't believe that I share this woman bio and why you come on her to ask is, is she married? And you know why you were you were she? I mean, in responding to that, you said something in passing. Uh, oh, she, whether she will come, uh, is she single? She will look for someone husband. That other language, that other misogynistic language of it's mm -hmm. never a man looking for a woman. Uh, you know, even if he's he's having um extra marital affairs, it's always she went beyond the girl husband. Oh, she she mm -hmm. did the movie behind it's never mm -hmm. he do so it's just this excuse in men culture on uh, that place scrutiny on women and hatred and blame and shame on mm -hmm. on women about yeah poor men but she knew the men were married like he's not a child <laughs> Mm -hmm. Which is yeah. ironic, right? Because many uh, in patriarchal society, they're the strong ones. So why? They are the why women usually like right? that. Exactly. You know. So now women are too powerful, and you know they have that sexual power, and they need to be controlled. We the ones, right? It implies mm -hmm. that men don't have the strength or the resolve to, you know, to respect their marital vows, right? So it's ironic, and it actually doesn't make any sense. And that's why you know the patriarchy it doesn't make sense. You know, but, really we but we don't yeah. think about we don't think about those things because like you said, we normalize it. It's in our psyche. Uh, uh yeah, our friend shared uh, uh something and then showing how women should this is how you should so the person is running away, but it's tracking feet somewhere, but she just use it. This is how women, single women should run away from married men. I say, yeah. Then I come and tell her, I say, yeah. On top of protecting myself against sexual harassment, cat calling, uh um. Uh, misogyny sexist i mean just think about everything on top of that i should i will also act protecting your marriage for you mm -hmm. yeah holding mm -hmm. your husband so that you can boast about him about having a good man who has no eyes for him even though he's not the one doing the work i'm the one who will reject him no then he goes to the nurse girl she every girl should do it for you to have for my man mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. but men can take everything. And I'm like, okay, if men can take everything, you saying that the head of your home has no standard. Take everything. Well, you can smile with people and take the men. So you placing higher expectation on me who just smile with you as compared to the one who you wrote people for your wedding. You spend a lot of money. You sleeping. I mean, just... The one that benefits so much from your relationship, no expectation on him because he can take anything. Are you just anything? Let's be thinking about these kind of things. Uh, and when we really say then, I know we're all socialized by the patriarchy, but that's why a new day is for us to be re-examining. Why do I think like this? Why am I expecting higher from her who just smile as compared to the one who say, who make commitment? Mm. What, critical what thinking. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you, that's a very good point the critical thinking that's required for the new day right which means that we can even there's a level of self-reflection there right that we have to sometimes question ourselves there's, there's an individual role in the larger social change that we need to see that there needs to be space and time for self-reflection you know honest self-reflection and critical thinking and really start to challenge some of the things that that we've just taken for granted for so long. So critical thinking is a is an important part of, of the fight for gender equality. You know, men have to question themselves the, the things that they've been taught, but women too. You know, why is it that I see with another woman as my threat? Why is it that I expect more from the woman than I would expect from my husband? Why is it the woman's responsibility? You know, if we do some honest self-reflection, we can start to question and say, okay, maybe it's the way that I was raised. Or maybe in my mother's generation, Certain things were um, normalized, and now we're in a new generation. We have to see things in a new way. So there's a lot of you know personal responsibility that we can each, which is good because it's empowering, right? The society can seem so big and so large, but we each have our own power. The way that we react to others, to other women, especially the way that we raise our children, 
the way we socialize our children, right? The way we socialize our boys, the way we socialize our girls to have, you know, to be able to have um, fewer gender restrictions and expectations placed on them. That's the way that we start to each of us in our own household make that change. I could talk to you forever, but I already, yeah, I agree for one hour. So I'm going to ask you if you have any suggestions and you made some of them in passing already, just as we close, as we end, I just need you to just uh, uh, hone in on them. Any suggestions, any recommendations um, for a new day? Oh, that's a, that's, and I've been saying a few, but I think there's so many. Um, I definitely think that we need to continue to educate ourselves. I'm very impressed by the way that you're reading, Priscilla, that you're going after academic literature, you know, because sometimes we write academic papers and we assume nobody's really reading. So I was surprised okay. when you contacted me and it's refreshing to know that we should continue writing because, you know, people are listening, people are reading and, and we're contributing to knowledge, right? So I think one is to continue to seek our own self-improvement, um, to, to educate ourselves. And education happens formally and informally. You don't have to be in a school classroom, right? We have this advantage of the information age of internet. There's so much interesting uh, um, literature, books and articles and papers that we have access to that we can continue to improve ourselves, continuously learn. Um, I think that's really important. And that's my, my number one recommendation that we should become a bookish people. I really feel that as Liberians, if we could get interested a little bit more, you know, when I first started teaching at the University of Liberia, when I first came home um, from the U.S., somebody said, oh, why will you go teach at the University of Liberia? It's, it's terrible. And, you know, the people gave me such a bad uh, impression, but I have truly loved teaching at the university. It's been about 12 years now that I've been teaching. And what I recognize is that Liberians have a hunger for knowledge. There's just not this society, it's, it's not broad with, you know, throughout the society, but there's so many Liberians that get one, two, three, four masters. Have you ever seen someone getting four masters degrees? And I started to realize it's because the university is a place where intellectuals come. They read, they discuss, they write papers, and we don't really have that in the broader society, right? How many radio shows are there on, on literature? How many um, bookstores can really stay open? I've known so many bookstores open over the years and they close because there's just not that demand. How many mm -hmm. public libraries that we have, right? And so I think, um, you know, I see that librarians are hungry for more discussion, for more debate, for more intellectual exchange. And I'm really hoping that that will become a norm in our society. And I think that will really be for us um, the way to the future, not just education in the formal sense, but that mm -hmm. hunger to learn, to know, to improve, um, and to engage more intellectually. I think it would have a big impact in all aspects of our society. So that's my number one recommendation. I think that we can all do that in our own way. Right? We can seek um, something knowledgeable, something interesting, something of value. Um, and you'd be surprised how it will contribute to you in the long run. You may not see it in the short run, but in the long run, it will really carry us far as a nation. So I think that uh, I'll do my professor plug you know, for really intellectual um, interest and, and debate and really for us to, to start to see ourselves as an educated and an intellectual people that we are and to bring that more and more to the front. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, my God. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gatner, for your time. Um, you know, yeah, thank you for joining us today. Um, this lady is on, she's working, she's out of Liberia right now, but she made time in, uh, in her hotel to be able to talk to us, and I just appreciate her time. Um, I'm going to share the link. Do you mind if I share the link of your publication? Please do. Uh, Please do. Okay. okay. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's a new day. We continue to have these kind of conversations, uh, uh, you know, especially when it comes to rethinking how we see women and girls in our society. Uh, the what I want to drive home as we end is that as we argue our culture, our culture, let's be able to call can encourage us on the history channel. Let's be able to study, you know, learn our culture, 
you able to, you you got to be able to know what it is that you're preserving. So let's be able to get to do that, and especially let's use gender lens, let's use feminist lens. Uh, uh, in whether is uh, uh, history or whatever we believe to be uh, um, true or sacred. If you're Muslim, is your if you're Christian, the book that you hold to be true. Let's apply gender. Uh, let's apply a feminist lens in the way we look at the world, and hopefully we all experience a new day and live a better day for the generation after us. Yeah, thank you for joining us today. Uh, next Sunday, we'll be here with another great, great uh, um, person. But thank you, Dr. Gardner, for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Priscilla. I look forward to coming back in the future. Sure, sure. That would be great. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, too. Take care. Thank <laughs> you. Bye-bye. We all have a